thank you everybody for joining the November meeting of the Library Marketing Book Club. Very excited to see you all and super excited, beyond excited, for our special guest uh, who has joined us, our author, Mr. Seth Godin. So, um, Seth, hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Seth is the author of countless books on marketing, and uh, this is Seth's blog, absolutely wonderful marketing blog that is uh, so digestible and so fill filled with wonderful information, um, and really, really happy to be reading this book um, with, with all of you. And uh, Seth, Seth, if you want to say anything really quickly, I, we didn't really talk about an intro, but if you'd like to say anything to say hello, we'd love it. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm grateful for the work everyone here does. I think that we don't give nearly enough credit to how hard it is to do what you do and the essential contribution you make to our culture. And, you know, mine is one of the only industries where people like me applaud a sector where I don't make any money, which is fine with me because I'm not doing this to make money. I'm doing this to make a difference. And your ability to show up and make the culture better really matters. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Seth. So, Seth, what, uh, what you and I were talking about on email this morning, what, what it would be awesome to get your thoughts of. So in the book, there is a section about uh, what about free and talk about you know, some things about free there and about how free is, is something that spreads well and something that, um, uh, you know, also is, is great. And a lot of people use free for lead generation and to bring people into their funnel. And, and I think we do the same thing. But it would be wonderful to hear your thoughts about what about when your product is effectively free, when your cost is kind of invisible because it's baked into taxes and, um, you know, and, and possibly donations. But, you know, really, when you're talking about a free product, how do you avoid the trap of, you know, this is something that, you know, does it actually have value because it's free? So I, I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, that's a great place to start. I don't know if it's your microphone or just the call in general, but can people hear me okay? It's not breaking up. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, there are two parts to the answer. The first part is uh, using a library isn't free, not even close. And that's one reason why very few people in your community show up. Uh, it's not free because you have to get there, you have to hassle, you have to park. It's not free because you feel stupid sometimes. It's not free because you don't understand if the time and energy you put into it uh, is going to be repaid in what you get, if it's not your habit. Uh, it's not free because a lot of people, I would say the majority of Americans have been brainwashed from an early age to believe that reading is a chore and that reading is school and it's something to be avoided. That when uh, DVDs started becoming more common, at least in most of the libraries I've interacted with, it became the most checked out thing in the whole place. Um, well, there's a reason for that. And part of the reason is they were ready to go to the place next door that cost $5 and there you were at zero. So it both cost, but yours cost less. So that's the first half is it's not free. It costs time and status and energy. And the second half is you like it. It's good if it's not free. And the reason is tension and status. So let's talk about the two of them. If I want to shoot a rubber band across the room, I have to pull it backwards. And only by pulling it backwards can it go forward. That act of pulling it backwards is called tension. Tension is what we feel before anything changes. And you apply tension all the time. If there's a waiting list for a popular book and I get the note that says it's available, oh, well, I don't want to ignore the sunk cost. I had something of value. It's about to disappear. There is tension in the sense of me being able to have something for a period of time. There is tension in how I feel before I ask a librarian for help. There's tension if you uh, run a thing on Saturdays and there's only room in the book group for 12 people and will I get in? Will I won't get in? My wife gave a speech at the local library three days ago and she was filled with tension, but there was also the tension of the people in the audience about was it what was going to happen next. So we get to do this on purpose. It is a tool. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And the other thing that's on offer is status. And status doesn't have to do with how much money you're born with. 
Status doesn't mean that my car costs more money than your car, though it might. Status is measured in lots of different things. And people get into a habit in any given setting. They either want to maintain their status, they want to move their status up, or they want to amazingly keep pushing their status down because they're most comfortable with low status. And you are adjudicators of status. You get to decide who is going to be elevated, whether you have a, you know, a third grade reading contest or you are uh, deciding who to um, help get to the next level. And so I think that as we think about that, it gets away from just saying, whatever our customers want is what we are here to serve them with. And realizing that marketing is the intentional act of changing the state of the person that we are dealing with. So Lori brings up a great question in the chat, but I don't believe that the only reason to go to a law library is because you're in a lawsuit, because after all, there's Google. That one of the things you get out of going to a building with a passionate, compassionate librarian is a sense of feeling less alone, of being connected, of discovering that there might be a way forward. And this is really good news because it means there's humanity to what you're doing. It's not just a warehouse for books. Sure. It's librarians who went to school for a reason, who trained for years for a reason. That reason isn't about understanding some uh, indexing decimal system. Computers can do that now. What computers can't do is be human and to show up for other people, to create the conditions for them to get where they're going. That's my six minute rant to get us started. <laughs> I think uh, I, I hope I speak on behalf of the group to say that's very relieving that uh, that uh, you, you've uh, relieved a lot of our attention that uh, that we do have something. And I think we do feel that we have something valuable. So, um, so yeah, so we really, really enjoy that. And yeah, it's, uh, it's wonderful to, uh, to get that insight. That's fantastic. That, um, and status is definitely something that I think people look at with a library card. People love to share that they have a library card. They love to share that they use the library. People love to say to other people that they go to a library. So I think there's, there's definitely a lot of value. In that. Yeah. Well, and so to give you a specific example, and then I'm going to, See if there's one or two questions that I'm going to have to log off. If I, if I was trying to uh, create the conditions for 10-year-olds to be more interested in the library, I would start uh, a streaks board and I would give kids a checkbox once a week if they showed up for any reason. How long can your streak go? Who's got the most gold stars on the streak? And then I would create circles of people and label the circles and things so that if you want to be seen as the kind of person who's read more soccer books in the library than anybody else, there you are. You're winning the soccer race. This is available to you. You, you know, at school, all they're doing is threatening kids with a grade. Here, you're giving kids this chance to move forward. And it's not just kids. If I had 20 work-at-home small business people in my community, I would not just sit back and let somebody else be the king of co-working. I would say, what value can I add to these 20 people by connecting them? Because if I can connect them, whether they're 20 people who think that they're victims of civil lawsuits or 20 people who are trying to make it as self-published authors, if you are the connector, you are doing your actual job of being a librarian. That's fantastic. And yeah, that's a great <laughs> streaks. People love those kind of things. People, kids love to be uh, on those things. So that's fantastic. Well, so if anybody has a question, um, I guess either you can raise your hand or just chime in if you have a question for Seth. Yeah, put it put it in the chat. It makes it a there lot. You go. Uh, put it in the chat. And we won't then we won't make noise in various libraries. We'll just get a voice. <laughs> Thank you, Seth. Does somebody have something in there? I'm waiting to see. While you're thinking about it, I just want to yeah. put a plug. I hope that Thanks. you will all get a copy of this for your library. I volunteered. I spent a year coordinating this project. This is the uh, Dutch edition. This is the Chinese edition. This is the Italian edition, uh, US edition. Um, this is the most important project of my lifetime. 
it oh, was wow. written to be in libraries. And it's published by Penguin. It was a bestseller in seven countries so far. I don't make a penny from it. Um, and as you can see, it's filled with the kinds of charts, graphs, tables, and facts, every page footnoted that every librarian likes. Okay, Keith, come on up mute. Let's see what you got to say. Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I wonder, uh, do you have any practical advice for expanding the reach to an audience with a low budget? I know in my personal experience, and I think that's probably the case across the library world in general, we don't have a huge budget for you know, uh, media advertising or billboards or any of that sort of thing. So do you have any practical things that would be um, doable uh, on, a, on a shoestring budget? Yeah, well, it's great news that you don't have a budget because it forces you to do the important stuff, not the expensive stuff. I don't have a budget either, and you might have heard of me. How did I do that? It's because you create things that other people want to talk about. So why on earth would neighbor A tell neighbor B about the library? What is happening at the library that's worth talking about? So to give you an example, uh, my mom helped invent the modern museum store. She was the co-founder of the Museum Store Association. She ran the museum store and bookstore in Buffalo at the Albright Knox Art Gallery. Um, and so I grew up with someone who ran a bookstore. And uh, one year, the trustees of the museum realized that only 2% of the population of Buffalo ever came to the museum. And it was long before PBS uh, did the Antiques Roadshow, but they got two people from Christie's or Sotheby's to volunteer to come to Buffalo. And they publicized through the newspaper, you could bring an antique and they would tell you if it was worth anything. And my mom got to work that day and there were 1,200 people waiting in line who had never been to the museum just because they wanted to get in to have this experience. So here you have this well-lit, clean, quiet uh, community building. Some people want to go there for a book, but other people want to go there because everybody else is going there. So what is the thing that people, you know, my wife got 70 people to come to her talk. And most of those people had never been to the library, not in five years anyway. So how do you create those moments where neighbors bring neighbors? then you get a chance to say, all right, this is the other thing we do here. Here's how we interact around this. Here's how we interact around uh, taking out a book. But here's also our board game collection. Not only do we have a board game collection, but we have a board game league. And if we have a board game league, we, you need to bring people to play because you can't play Monopoly by yourself. I hope no one plays Monopoly because it's a stupid game, but you get that. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm just scanning down here. Angela asks, people don't want what you make, they want what it will do for them. Can I expand on that a bit? How can libraries focus on the feelings that services create rather than the services themselves? So here's what I have discovered uh, having written more books than you know. It's almost impossible to give a book away for free. The <laughs> act of handing somebody a book is different than the act of handing them a chocolate bar. Nobody turned, you know, during Halloween, lots of people show up because they want a free chocolate bar. No one ever asked me for a free book because <laughs> as I said at the beginning, people feel this emotional tax when it comes to books. And yet no one wants to be illiterate. No one wants to be uninformed and nobody wants to be seen as stupid. So what you do for them is you are offering them a way to trade time for status, for comfort, for community, for connection. And sometimes it looks like this, sometimes it doesn't. But that's the thing. The book is a tool. The book is not the point that there's enough books on the typical street in the typical privileged neighborhood that if you close down, people would find someone they could borrow a book from. That's not the point. The point is that you are this institution in a digital age when people would rather be looking at their thing, where there's a token, there's a souvenir, there's a totem that reminds them of who they want to be. And that is, um, that's what's available to you. And it's amazing that you have complete authority over it. You don't need anybody's permission. You should just do it. 
And, you know, one of the, the coolest things, I, I can't remember Pearl's first name. They, she has an action figure um, from, she's the Seattle librarian. Angela yes, knows, she's yes. going to win. Oh. Angela, you win $5. Who, what's her name? Oh my God, I can't think of her last name, but, but. <laughs> she has the figure. I have the figure. Uh, Look, oh wait. It's, oh my oh, God. You have, <laughs> It's Nancy Pearl. Right? Nancy, Nancy Pearl, Pearl, that's it. Yeah. I got it too. It's Nancy Pearl. I got to show you. Do you so after, even work in a library if you don't have her? After, <laughs> Nan, after Nancy Pearl became a, a hit, I <laughs> talked to the people at Archie McPhee and they made one of these. So Nancy and I go way back. But anyway, um, the thing is, Nancy Pearl, on her own accord, decided that all of Seattle would read the same book at the same time. What's keeping you, right? That you have an email list. If you don't, you should make it bigger. People who want to hear from you, not so that you can be a bureaucrat, but so that you can talk to them in the voice of the community of people who are connected and smart. And so I'm going to stop pushing my luck. I want to wish you luck with your work. Keep talking about these ideas. Make a ruckus. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you, Seth. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Seth. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Holy crap. That was holy. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Wow. Um, Chris very cool. That. that was very fortunate. Um, yeah. <laughs> and please don't everybody drop off now, but if you have to, um, <laughs> I know, I know we're not Seth Godin, but, um, but no, that was amazing. Yes. And so for those of you who didn't hear the story, I'll tell real quick. So I do write to every one of our authors to see if they'll come on with us. Um, and at first, and you know, Seth's first response was, that's so cool. That's great. You know, he says, sometimes it's kind of just more the awe of, oh, he's here and it doesn't always work as well. Um, so here's some, you know, and I shared some videos with, with you all. Here's some videos and, and other things about some of the topics that maybe you want to talk with. And then this morning, I was re-listening to the book, and, and I listened to the part on free. And I thought, oh, it'd be really cool to get, like, just a little tidbit from him about that. So I wrote to him. I said, hey, what about this thing with free? And then he wrote back and said, hey, I'll jump on at 3 o'clock. So holy cow. So we have that on tape. So that's awesome. Uh, I really like what he said too about free. It's not free to come to the library. You know what? I never, yeah. ever thought of that, ever. Yeah. I mean, that makes me feel stupid, but it's like, you're right. They got to get here. They got to park their car. They, then they're feeling intimidated because they're not sure if they've never been here or they've got a question asked. They don't know who to go to, who to ask. They feel stupid. Never, ever thought of that. That was brilliant. Really was awesome. Yeah, I agree, Mary. Uh, can y'all hear me okay now? Um, mm -hmm. I turned off this other, yeah, better than it was anyway. The other microphone, I don't know. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, I agree, Mary. I think I think that's it's super important. Um, and uh, and yeah, I, the thing about not wanting to feel stupid, and so I didn't think about that as a cost before. You know, I mean, you can think about like, oh, the time it takes and those kind of things. But yeah, there's a lot more that people have to give up and people have to willing to share, be willing to share and, and surrender in order for them to, uh, to, to come here. So I, I thought that was, yes, oh man, that was super cool. Um, so, so whether or not you read the book, we, we don't judge you if you're here and you didn't read the book, um, but if you have read the book, um, Anybody have, uh, we, we'll do now what we usually do when we start, anybody have, uh, you know, or if anybody wants to talk about anything Seth said, um, you know, what were your thoughts about the book? What, you know, what did you like? What were some notes? Um, so, uh, shoot. Bang. <laughs> hey, Laurie, Laurie, what do you think? You know what? I, I got the, the, the book on CD and okay. or actually an MP3. So it was on my phone. I was listening to it in my car and away to work and from work. Yep. And the only thing that kind of bothered me is he kept saying, this is marketing. And I felt oh. like that this is a lecture that's really a lecture. <laughs> it felt <laughs> like a lecture. So, and I guess for me, my style, what I loved about the Stephen Covey thing is he condensed everything. 
Uh -huh. So the other that I got from Seth, and, and you know what? He doesn't come across like that at all in person. Yeah. Right. which i find funny i'm glad yeah. i'm glad though because i kept thinking oh i hope this isn't gonna be <laughs> <laughs> i actually literally don't i don't want to i turned the, it off a couple times the volume oh. <laughs> i was getting radio rage oh, <laughs> <in no. car. laughs> and it's not, you know the point that angela made that's exactly what i that was the most important thing and i have started implementing some of the things like the newsletter i worked on today i put a lot of you's in you yeah. are this is for you please join us you know make it more personal kind of thing hey we want to see you yeah. <laughs> at our next uh training so but um i think that what's tough too and we just discovered this yesterday never even thought about it i worked in a public library for 12 years carnegie library business and i worked in music and art too loved it in pittsburgh here loved it loved it loved it i'm working here it's like why the heck am i so stressed out <laughs> all the time but that's kind of why i made the point that i did is most of the people 99 percent of them coming through that door are involved in a lawsuit they're either an attorney or they're pro se and by the time they've come through the door they already have um a level of tension that's higher than the most average person because they're scared they're going to lose maybe where they live they are going through divorce it's ugly as you know what um custody of their children I'm like you know these are life-changing events that they are going through yeah. and ev almost every single person coming through our doors is at that level so yeah. at one point what started it is something escalated in and we were told to de-escalate people and it's like whenever this happens like it happens once in a while it's yeah. every person that comes through that door we hand out kleenexes we give them a yeah. hug if they want one you know that's the humanity part that we get sure. but yeah. i think people don't under don't get it and i didn't get it myself until yesterday <laughs> <laughs> and it was actually an attorney saying you're dealing with a whole different group of <laughs> patrons and once it was you're right that's why i'm exhausted all the time so but it doesn't make me like the job any less because i love oh. helping people and finding information but i'll tell you what <laughs> i go home and get my jammies and, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and veg so yeah, i'll shut up I'll no, that's great. No, it's great. There, yeah, there okay. definitely is. And and in the book too. I mean, you know, he talks and he talked about it today, talking about different types of tension, but talks about creating tension and relieving tension. And that's what it's all about. It's about um scarcity and fear of missing out and and gaps and and story gaps, like we talked in other things. So yeah, it's pretty cool. What other thoughts about the book? Anybody else have anything else to share about the book? If you've read any part of it is fine and if not i got things to talk about i was just going to share chris i think that kind of the opposite a little bit is you know sharing the stories of what people are getting from libraries too right so how do you intrigue and interest people to kind of get the you know like hey i didn't know i could do that i can you know consider yeah. this so telling those stories to kind of drive interest to get people excited yeah people love to hear stories of others and they love to hear that yeah that that's the kind of experience they could have but definitely i think that's definitely a strong thing and that's you know big part of the book is what you know what do you want to change what change do you want to have i mean that's the other one that keeps repeating over and over again is what is the change that you're trying to make and who is the change that you're trying to make it for um so yeah it's super cool um uh, you know, a lot of what the book is, um, what I thought was really interesting was that, you know, it's not about, and we've talked about this in other things, but it's not about what you make, it's not about what you have, but it's about what makes people feel, and, um, you know, I think that's something that, uh, that, um, you know, it, it can be difficult to come across within our marketing, especially because the things that we have are so different. Um, but does anybody have any um, thoughts about that concept, about the concept of, you know, it's not about the thing, so it's not about the, um, you know, the ebook platform, it's not about Hoopla, it's not about, you know, what it is, but it's about how it can make you feel. Um, I thought that was a very interesting part. Anybody have any uh, thoughts or comments on that? Mm -hmm. 
when I was reading it, I'll just make a comment. I always, I always think about like paint commercials. You don't see the mess of the paint and you don't see him trying to get all the tools, but you see these really happy people staring at their walls. And I think yeah. that's what, I was trying to think of all the ways that you can market the library because everybody uses the library differently, right? There's the people who get books for children. There's the people who are looking out to get a job. And like, there's many stories to tell. And I can feel uh, with with Keith had said, like, we have a limited budget. How can we do that? I actually think that this group, if we're all marketers, would be able to help each other out to make really impressive I don't know. I don't want to say like a social media ad, but to come up with stories to tell and work together to present something like this, where, you know, it's the, the finish, because sometimes you have a hard time finding these people or you, and you just need help, right? Or you just need a bigger right. budget. And I think if we all work together, that might be a possibility. Just a thought. I'm mean, no pressure, but, <laughs> but like, I would love to see a bunch of people staring at their books happily or getting jobs or having like this beautiful, but resources are tight. And how do we do this? Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's a great point, Amanda, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this somewhat just, I'll share a recent thing that's somewhat related to this. Um, uh, we did a, a kind of a real quick audit of our social media. Um, and among the things that we found that people really like, um, people love, well, first of all, people love book sales. Oh my God, if your friends has a book sale, that that we could send those, we could do those all day long and everybody would get, you know, the best engagement ever. Um, and people love like old, you know, old pictures stuff and, and special collections and those kind of things. But the other thing that people really love are pictures of just people, pictures of customers and very little stories of customers, because I think like, you know, maybe that's what you're saying. Those are the, that, that evokes that feeling of what that is. We have this one picture, I should pull it up. It's, um, these three kids, three teens and they, um, we had a Super Smash Brothers tournament in the teen library here. And it's just a picture of these three teens with their little trophies. That was one of the most engaged posts we had in the last three months. Um, so people love to see anything when it's just somebody in a library and somebody doing something. And, and um, you know, it's interesting to think about. And I love your idea about, yeah, how can we share this among each other and how can we create some of that? Um, you know, there's definitely tools that, that we all use that we could do that. Um, but I would love anything, any part of the community that people would like to share these little successes that they have when they, um, you know, when they hit on something that somebody feels, you know, feels good or, or um, you know, something that works really well, so. What are some other thoughts or um, things about, uh, you know, either the book or the things we've talked about? Hey, Shandy. Hey there. So I admit I didn't read the book. However, I have read excerpts in the past and I used to read his blog regularly and I was totally fangirling. <laughs> I had glad I had my mute on because I'm pretty sure I was like making little squeals. <laughs> uh, so. I, I was thinking about what he was saying about the feeling and creating, you know, that feeling. And my first background is in public relations, which I think is uh, too often, very sadly, separated from marketing. I think good marketing and PR uh, are very much, you know, two perspectives of the same thing. Yeah. And I know when I try to promote our programs, I know it's easier for me to identify like who would find the programs useful. So I use that hook to insert some of that in there, whether it's, you know, make sure you don't like, so Illinois Heartland Library System, I should say, is a, is a little different. We're more like a library services agency. So we serve the libraries. So we are having a sexual harassment training, for example. And in Illinois, every uh, small business, like every staff and every small business, including libraries, has to take a yearly training. So we're offering them this for free. So it's not just a, I make a point to say, not just we're offering this, but mm -hmm. Let us take this 
let us make this easier for you yes. by you know letting you share this with your staff and you can use this like something like that so that's got me thinking i try to put the you know the why and some of that feeling and who they are in there um, you know assuming the person wants to be a law abiding library director <laughs> When we talk about the organization as a whole, I get more stuck though, because like our brochure that talks about us overall, for example, I had to decide and I did pick, I did pick one. I did like, I have personas in my head. I have them semi written out, um, but I get a little more stuck on who that overarching piece is to be written for. So I'm curious how, some of you guys do that for an overall big picture as opposed to the more targeted programs. Yeah. yeah. Does anybody have some thoughts? I'd love to hear some thoughts from some others about, about that. Well, I, I, I'll say too that, you know, we have so many discrete audiences. So what Shandy's saying is so true for all of us. Right. I think even at a specifically law library, you have just different audiences, different groups, things, different things resonate with different people. And my predecessor did a big library love campaign, and I've continued that. So, I mean, I just try to really celebrate if somebody especially is giving us kudos for something. We have a new expansion for a new space and all that. People are excited about this new makerspace possibility. Just, you know, tagging that with library love, just saying, you know, thank you for sharing our excitement and kind of um, bringing it back up to library love. Like that's sort of my baseline. Does that make sense? Um, and it works for any different audience, you know? I, it, so it's it's a simple thing, but I use it on social um, as a way to kind of acknowledge this is just one thing of all the reasons we all love the library. So. Yeah, I, and Evelyn, that's cool. I think, you know, and there is something too in there um, in the book um, also that talks about um, brand marketing versus direct marketing. So Shandy, yeah, I mean, there is things that, you know, that you need to do at the brand level. And yeah, that is kind of Evelyn, like that library love, like, you know, that, you know, is there something at the brand level that can continue building that affinity for people? Um, but yeah, but it's hard. It's hard. You know, it, it, it's, there's a lot in the book about, and a lot that he says all the time about, you know, targeting and, and being, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to target everybody. And, um, you know, there's one example in the book of the um, Amazon reviews. So you look at Harry Potter, you know, one of the huge, 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 huge bestsellers. Well, there's like 1,200 one and two star reviews. So it's not for everybody. Not everybody's right. Not everybody's wrong. Um, so, you know, so who is that audience that you can find? But, uh, but still, I mean, there is the brand. There is, there is something that's important. And yeah, I think Evelyn, you know, that, that kind of um, focusing on that to see where you can grab some of those people and grab some of their intention is a great idea. Um, yeah. I think it goes along um, too yeah, with what you're saying about feeling because what is the feel the feeling that I find I try to echo back is community pride and connectedness, right? So it's it's not just, hey, I don't have kids, I only come for business events. It's I'm so proud that we have this resource that offers things for people of all ages, that offers what people need in our community. So I think that that's the feeling I'm trying to echo in those moments is, is community pride in what we have, which would also be true for IHLS, you know, a pride and connection and, and services offered. So maybe that's generic enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. And another theme that keeps up going through the, you know, that another statement that he uses a lot, um, am I the kind of person who, and, and, you know, is this the kind of person who I am? Am I somebody who, um, you know, who, who that community pride is important to? Am I somebody who that, you know, and that's, you know, that's maybe who we're, we're looking to reach and that, you know, in, in some of our messaging, especially when you talk about our brand messaging. Um, yeah. Um, other things that people have, I have some, uh, some more, but uh, Angela, Brian? Yeah, um, one of the things, um, a friend of mine, she does marketing for um, a large medical network, 
Um, so that's, you know, completely different than libraries. Um, but we, we chat a lot because um, I'm kind of new to the marketing world. And one of the things she was talking about, um, she just kind of started her role and she was talking about the idea of um, user experience and how do you bring a user through the, the funnel. And, you know, in the, the medical world, there are lots of different experiences. Maybe you're a pregnant you know, woman, maybe you are, um, you know, dealing with cancer or whatever. Um, and so that really got me thinking about what are the different users in a library. Um, and the, the phrase that comes to my mind a lot is a pathway. Um, you know, what kind of pathway can I guide these different users, you know, because how a parent uses a library is very different than an older person or a young professional or um, you know, someone that's just there for the computers. Um, so I've been kind of thinking about like, how do I break down the marketing of the library a little more for those user experiences? Um, so yeah, so I liked kind of all of the, the things that he was talking about. I started to think about pathways again. Yeah, yeah, I think that's important. And yeah, and then, you know, something else that talks about in the book is something about um, your minimum viable audience, like who's the fewest, the least number of people you would need to make this worth it. And, you know, so that's a way to look at your audiences. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, not every audience you have necessarily, and I think this goes to what you're saying, Andy, is not everything you have is, um, you know, needs to be that 80% of your audience or your 50% or your 20%. And just who is it that you need to reach with that? And I mean, I guess it can start to seem expensive in terms of time to do that. But I'll tell you, I mean, you know, it uh, it's worked, you know, I mean, it's worked for us to have we have very, we have very specific um, email lists and we market just, you know, we, those are really the people that we send emails to. We rarely send emails to huge groups of people because it just, you know, it's just harder to find out. So we get permission from people to send um, them emails about things that they want. And those are the best performing things we have. Those are the people that go to the most programs that we have that, that check out, you know, that, that are the best users. And, um, you know, there's something about, yeah, looking for, looking for some of those and looking for what people do. So, yeah. Um, and I think um, there was something else too. Oh, <laughs> this is something I think we've talked about. Um, so is there anybody, is anybody... <laughs> Does anybody change up things so fast because you're bored of it and then you realize that you haven't put enough time in it? That was a, that was a big, that was a concept in the book. Um, does anybody do that? Has anybody given up on something or felt like you had to give up on something because it's too soon or you've seen it too many times? Um, it was just interesting in the book. He said, we might be bored with our marketing, but, um, but the market trains us to associate frequency with trust. So the more frequent you show up, um, the more trustworthy you're going to be. But I'm just curious, anybody uh, has any experience or thoughts about boredom with your own messages? Are you sick of seeing your own messages? I think if you're not marrying it, when you're speaking really generally, you're not hitting marks and you're not hitting as many people. And so that can be tiresome. You don't feel the success. Um, but I just wrote in the chat, you know, my segmented emails, much like yours, are so much more successful than like the monthly to everybody. And that says something about marketing is that you really need to pinpoint who you're going for. And it ends up being a lot of work, but you don't get bored of a lot of work, right? <laughs> That's right. Yes. That is something that doesn't get boring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're, you're not going to be bored of, uh, yeah, working on these different, uh, different audiences and different messages. And, uh, but, you know, I think we've seen, you know, things. Yeah. I, but you're right, Amanda. I think that, uh, that it's, it's, it actually makes it pretty interesting work when you come up with all these different uh, segments that you have and talking to them and, and understanding how to talk to them differently. Rhiannon, did you have something? Oh, you had to leave. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> I was but, just going to say, too, people need to hear yeah. stuff over and over and over again. They don't remember anything. I mean, think about your own self and all the information that is, you know, you're barraged with stuff all the time and you just can't remember. So you have to just keep saying it over and over and over again. And I know in my past lives in different industries where I worked in marketing, I used to get grief from colleagues that I worked with, not marketing people. Oh, God, you've seen that so many times. It's the same old thing, you, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's so boring. But that's brand. That's, I mean, look at the brands that have are so strong. Coca-Cola, for crying out loud. Nike. I mean, their logo and their colors have never changed. I mean, if you think about the really strong brands and strong companies, they're the ones that have been saying the same message over and over and over again. And we, you know, you look at something 5 million times, even before it's launched, and you're so sick of it. But that's, that's not the market. So they're not looking at what you're doing 5,000 times a day. So you just have to remember that what you're doing is creating that brand and that awareness and it, you just have to stick to it. Don't give up. That's right, yeah. Yes, and it's important. It's important for us to keep yeah. in mind and uh, that, this, that, this, <laughs> that this is not for us and it's important for us to help our staff see that this is not for them. I mean, they might be also, but, but generally this is not for them. Yeah, if they see it a million times and they're sick of it, well, you know, that that's because it's not for them. It's it's not, yeah, we, we you know, other people are advertising things to them. Um, there was something too in there that, that, uh, that I, I um, if you, so if you had a chance to read it, and I think you'll remember this, if you haven't, I think you'll understand this uh, pretty easily, but um, he talks in there about advertising and about television advertising in particular. And he says something to the effect of, um, TV ads are a tax for the brands that can afford it. So um, television ads are something that, uh, you know, it, from, from what he says, he says that television ads are noise and they are just something that, you know, the large brands have to um, do. They just have to do regularly because they're expected to and they have the, they have the money like Coca-Cola to put in the time and to put in the, the thing. But we don't. Now, um, for the most part, I don't know, maybe maybe some of you do have <laughs> enough money to do enough TV advertising. But to that end, if you do have, and we talk about this sometimes, maybe on this already, but if you do get a little bit of money to do some type of advertising, what is your inclination? Like, do, you know, people, I mean, people sometimes kind of, I feel pressure sometimes if I get a little bit of money, people are like, ooh, could we put it on television? It's like, well, yeah, we could run it for a week, you know, or, or you know, eight times in a month or something like that. Um, but what is your thought about, um, you know, when you do get that advertising money to make the most of it so you're not falling into noise? Or does do you not think? Do you think that just even a little bit of television advertising, which I could see too, because people love libraries. And if they do catch the message, I think it's going to stick. But what are your all thoughts about that, about television advertising and, and you know, more expensive brand advertising for, for libraries? So when was his book written because that was one of his first books wasn't it <laughs> it was a i i don't know it's it was 2018. 2018 oh that's one of the newer oh, ones okay yeah i wonder what the definition of tv advertising is i'm assuming that's cable in which that makes a lot of sense cable or something as broad as cable mm -hmm. um but maybe video advertising like very targeted vid video advertising on other digital mediums might possibly be worth it. it I, I think it just depends. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a good point, Shandy. I, I think that, um, I didn't think about that. That's a very good point because now you can do some video advertising and get to a real specific audience when you're talking about the web, when you're talking about social. Um, yeah, no, that's a great point. Have you, have you all done any Shandy for, um, you know, there or, or at another we place you've been before? have done a little bit, but mm -hmm. only in this, and I remember we're B2B, but one of our 
one of our tasks is to um, advocate in small ways to the public on behalf of libraries. So we don't have a ton of staff time and budget to do that, but the one thing we've done is we've partnered with um, the PBS channel in Carbondale, Illinois, and we have a sponsorship piece, which is like an advertisement, but it's it has a lot of restrictions on it, uh, specifically talking about the different, you know, sp sponsored by the libraries, the public libraries of uh, Central and Southern Illinois offering this, 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 and this. And our thought there was we only have it during certain shows. It's a long-term thing. Um, and it's really aimed at that trying to change the idea of the library is just the public library is just books. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's that. And it's also these other things. And so that we were, we chose that audience, that particular audience. Um, it's the, some of the kids programming, because we mm -hmm. know it's going to hit, you know, preschoolers, preschool parents, and uh, not just preschoolers up to like age seven or so, okay, yeah. and homeschoolers. Mm -hmm. And so it's a pretty targeted audience, but also they do most of the work for us and it was relatively inexpensive. So it kind of made sense. But in general, I think that totally makes sense. Like, I don't think generally speaking, that's where library's money should probably be. Maybe an exception is really big library systems like Chicago Public Library, maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good point, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think there may be some of these targeted opportunities where, yeah, you can get a little smaller, you can get a little closer to your actual audience and, and do some of that, but it's it's tricky, yeah. I mean, yeah, like we did, we did a couple TV ads for some of our, um, you know, author talks. And uh, I mean, again, TV is, you know, it's TV really, it's not really direct response. So, um, you know, there really isn't much of a way um, to quantify other than asking people, you know, or, or listening for people saying that. But, uh, but yeah, it's just interesting. And, uh, you know, and then conversely, we've just recently done a direct mail campaign, um, which I, which we're waiting for the results, but thinking it went a little better. Um, so yeah, so it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting to think about, um, what is the, where should we spend the money? If we do get that little bit of money, what should we do, um, to spend it? So, yeah. Chris, uh, um, yeah. Um, our, there's a local, we have a couple of local papers, of course, we used to have more than that, but anywho, but Pittsburgh Post-Gazette is not very, <laughs> I Client friendly, that's okay, whatever. Triblot has a okay. uh, carousel that you can advertise a workshop. We, we've gone, we've done more workshops for the general public than we ever have. Mm -hmm. And so, as long as it is a free workshop, you don't have to pay to have it on that carousel. Nice. And it stays until the day of. Oh, but it's wow. there in that carousel. If you know enough ahead of time, that really has been helpful to us. Yeah. Um, they, if you spend, I think there's 50 bucks, if you're 49 something, you can get it shipped out to 100 other publications in oh, the wow. Pittsburgh area. And we've gotten a lot of good feedback with that. We've gotten a lot of people into programs that we may not have reached at all before. Yeah. Now, we always do. An advertisement, a couple of advertisements, and typically an article with the local lawyers uh, publication. But we really want to let the general public know that we're here there as well, because <laughs> we're the best kept secret in <laughs> Pittsburgh. We don't want to be. So actually, we even were part of a, a tour called Doors Open. Um, a lot of the larger cities have that too, I do believe, and you can check into that. We were part of that so that people come through to see the architecture, whatever. I actually did have somebody kind of say that, oh, it's a book museum. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> no, 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 not what we want. Oh, no. 
it gave me a yeah. chance to talk to somebody in front of other people saying, hey, wait, we're still viable. It's not just books. We do have computers. Not everything's online. And it just was really nice to connect to people, all kinds of ages, um, races, you know, you name it, yeah. you know, families. It was great. It really was great. So, yeah. and I did say something earlier about, I want to say stakeholders are, and we have a person in in management that wanted us to make a list of who are your stakeholders who are the people that need to use you and one of the things yeah we could say the general public but you know what we got very specific yeah we said the elderly okay so then we pull all those sources legal sources in our case of what they can use at our library and also websites things like that one-stop shopping for them and we've okay. done it I can't, I'm, the police are, you know, it's both ways. We're letting people know how to connect to the police, but the police also have issues of, to help people with PFAs. So mm -hmm. that was another element. And any of the programs, workshops that we've done on Zoom, we have recorded and we've added them. They're on our YouTube channel, but the other part of that is they're connected on our website. So you can just click on our website um, and the other action that I've said before, and I swear to God, I couldn't believe how much of an impact it was. Google my business. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah very... Oh, my goodness. We're getting so many hits from that. And they call every day to see if we answer the phone and tell me. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It, it, the impact of Google is really it's it's so much more than you could even imagine. So yeah. don't don't overlook it because it just I've concentrated more on that than I have in a long time. Yeah, so no, it's a great point, Laura. Yeah. If anybody has not claimed their businesses on Google My Business, highly recommend you do. You'll get the reviews and people review libraries a lot more often than you would expect. Um, and uh, and you get wonderful feedback. We're actually working on making that you know a big part of what we're measuring this year is is in our Google reviews for each of our locations. So um, very very valuable and and uh, pretty. They're making it easier and easier to interact with it. Plus, you can change your times real fast. Like you can not super fast, but you can change like you know if the library closes because of something or um, you know something happens that uh, that you need people to know and that's where people are looking people are not coming to the library website to look when your hours are people are looking at google first and that's coming up so um, highly recommend that you do that um uh i had a couple other things that I, you know one other thing that i wanted to to just mention um we got just a few more minutes here um, if anybody has anything else, wrap, raise your hand and and uh, and we can do that. But um, something that uh, that I I was talking with somebody today who went to a conference, and at this conference they had a speaker, and the speaker talked about this one term that I think we all hear, and some of us even you know sometimes it's it's easy to say, but um, if so, so what do you think about this? Uh, <laughs> Uh, so the speaker said, when when libraries talk about not we're more than books or we're not just books, um, his thing was what you're telling people, what people may be hearing when you say that is that you're ashamed that you're of books. So I thought that was super interesting and a really interesting way to say it. And I hadn't thought of it in that way. It's not that we don't want to communicate with people that we have things other than books, but it was just interesting. That, and this was somebody outside of the industry um, who talked about that. So I don't know if anybody has any thoughts or reactions to that, but, uh, but it, I think it, I comment thought. on that. So yeah. we also mentioned we're more than just books. So we're actually shining on a light on the word books again which yeah. is not helpful kind of like when you yeah. have a peace <laughs> rally versus um you know a, a war against some, something or another so yes <laughs> the war on drugs caused more people to take drugs yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah no well, amanda you're right you know, i think the challenge is how do you embrace the books as a brand which for yeah. like it or not is the library brand but yet indicate that there are other things that they can connect with as well Agreed. and distilling that down into a very simple message is not easy oh, it's uh, 
So yeah. I was very, I was very inspired when um, Seth was talking and he was saying stuff about um, show what the library has like in, as a result. So when you're looking for a job, show that someone's got a job in the library. And I actually was writing down things. So I was like, I, I was in this meeting. I was like, I'm not, I don't love the saying more than just books. It's stuck in around for so long. Um, but really saying something of, you know, what's available at the library is the person you want to be or the person you want to become and that your future is available at the library, library, <laughs> you know, that yeah. sort of message. That's what I was thinking. Sorry. I love that, Amanda. I think that's right. Lisa, you're right. It's, it's tricky. I mean, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's tough to come up with something, but Amanda, that was a really, <laughs> that was really good. That was a really good insight. I like that, that, uh, that what you want to become, because that's what people want to look for. And I've been thinking about the same thing. Like when we, when we, um, in our community, we have this reading, um, initiative people want to get kids reading up to third grade level like reading on level on grade level up to third grade level and a lot of what was focused on um was more about like well how do parents read to kids like let's give parents more ideas about how they can read to their kids and i just thought oh that's not i mean why don't we make it uh, important to parents that kids read parents know how to read to their kids they know i mean most you know well i mean unless they have their own you know literacy issues or something but um but it was just it was uh, it was just like no kid, you know you want to tell the parents do you want your kid does your kid want to grow up to be a youtube influencer <laughs> then this is the path this is the gateway this is how you get there this does your kid want to grow up to be an astronaut a doctor whatever they want to be but a lot of kids want to be influencers <laughs> um but uh but yeah it's it's you know and what do they want to be what's that future what do you want to become i think that's awesome i think that's wonderful um, well, we just we just have a couple minutes left, um, but I want to thank everybody for coming and showing up today. Um, that was uh, wonderful that you all showed up. I hope you got tons of value out of it. I know that I think that was probably one of the most valuable things. Uh, this was this was a wonderful meeting. We've had other great meetings. I think all our meetings are great. This one with Seth was was such a sweet bonus. Um, so next month, uh, before you go, we'll, we'll do a drawing in a second, but next month um, we'll be talking about um, Jenna Kutcher's book. Um, uh, what's it called? Something really. Um, how are you really? How are you really? Yes. So uh, interest, you know, it should be fun because it's a little bit of a departure from, you know, all of our marketing books, but I, I know there's a lot in there. Um, take a listen to Jenna's podcast. Her podcast is awesome. Um, and, uh, she unfortunately will not be able to join us. I've already, um, gotten that she, uh, she has, uh, some kids and, and, uh, she just, she just won't be able to, but that's okay. Um, so, uh, before we go, um, we always do a little drawing. So let's see, we've got, uh, 24, 26. So, um, how about Amanda pick a number between one and 25? Wait, um, yeah, one and 25. Me, Amanda? Amanda Roberts. 19. Okay, so 25, 24, 23, 23, 24, 20, 19. Anna Marie. Um, Anna Marie, you win a copy of Jenna's book. So um, I will connect with you um, through Facebook. So keep an eye out on your, um, on your DMs on Facebook. I will send you a message. We'll get you all set up and you'll get a copy of the book. So... Um, thank you again, everybody, for joining. We will, uh, I will make sure that this recording is available um, on the website, and uh, I'll send out a survey. If you can fill out the survey, would love to hear your feedback. Thank you again, everybody, and happy Thanksgiving for everybody who celebrates Thanksgiving. Have a wonderful day. And